what's important there is that during the depletion phase, the low calcium with the done really reduced the bone mineral content and the bone mineral content gain compared to the low calcium. And this was also the case during the repletion phase. So they still had increased calcium and phosphorus digestibility, but they could not improve their bone mineral content even though they uh, absorbed more calcium and phosphorus. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Beatrice Sauvé, a postdoctoral fellow at the Quebec Swine Development Center. So Beatrice, before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a brief introduction about yourself? So like you said, I am a postdoctoral fellow at the Quebec Swine Development Center, and now I work with feeding high vitamins to sows and the effects on uh, sour reproduction, and also the piglet's survivability. But before that, I did my PhD at Laval University uh, in Quebec. Um, so I worked mostly on mycotoxins, and most more specifically, uh, the mycotoxin deoxynivalino, which I will call done because it's easier that way. Um, so yeah, I worked on done, and specifically the effect on calcium and metabolism on piglets. But I also had a part of my thesis that was on inflammation response and oxidative stress by done on piglets and the impact of supplementing vitamin D, E or C to piglets um, to see if it could uh, reduce the effects of done. A leader in swine nutrition solutions driven by science. Novus's products and services look at the whole animal, focusing on productivity and well-being, in order to feed the world affordable and wholesome food. For more information, visit Novus's website at www.novusint.com. Gotcha. So like you already mentioned, with your research that you've been doing with mycotoxins and looking at the effects of vomitoxin or DON, on the calcium and phosphorus metabolism in pigs. Could you tell us tell us a little bit about what you're doing there? Yeah, so to start from the start, um, part of my thesis was on the inflammation and oxidative stress. But what we saw on piglets is that the done obviously reduces the um, growth performance and the feed intake, but also it increased the bone mineral content relative to body weight, which was surprising. So then we also evaluated gene expression in uh, kidney, intestinal, mucosa, and we tried to see if it could affect the calcium and phosphorus metabolism since bone metabolism is related to calcium and phosphorus. So what we saw is that done reduces uh, the gene expression related to calcium and phosphorus, uh, well, calcium reabsorption by kidney and calcium absorption in the intestinal mucosa. For phosphorus, it was kind of the opposite. So the um, gene expression relative to excretion of phosphorus was actually reduced. So then we thought, okay, so we want to go and see what DUN does more specifically on calcium and phosphorus, but not just gene expression. So we tried it with more digestibility. So what we did on the next uh, animal phase was that we had four treatments. So two control treatments with normal calcium levels. It was a 0.65% total calcium. So one control, control, and the other control was with done. And then we had two other treatments, which were uh, reduced uh, low levels of calcium. So we had 0.39% of total calcium. Again, we had a normal low calcium, no done, and one treatment low calcium with done. And this was done for 13 days. So we call it a depletion phase. And then after this depletion phase, we had a repletion phase where everyone received a normal calcium uh, level, no more done. So what we saw in the first phase 
with that done really increased the calcium and phosphorus digestibility um, after five days, but also after 13 days. So between the phase and after the phase, while just low calcium, it increased after five days, the calcium and phosphorus digestibility, but not after 13 days. So Don was really uh, the driving here. And then after that, during the repletion phase, the calcium and phosphorus digestibility was still increased. And um, well, also for low calcium, uh, they also increased. But what's important there is that during the depletion phase, the low calcium with the dun really reduced the bone mineral content and the bone mineral content gain compared to the low calcium. And this was also the case during the repletion phase. So they still had increased calcium and phosphorus digestibility, but they could not improve their bone mineral content even though they uh, absorbed more calcium and phosphorus. Gotcha. And you also said at the beginning how you've been doing some work with vitamin supplementation and seeing how that affects um, the negative impacts of Dawn. So what did that research look like exactly? So we did evaluate the vitamin D status, so the 25, the 25 OHG3 in blood and the calcitriol, which is also called the 125-OH2-D3, um, the active form of vitamin D. So in our first trial, what also uh, made us look into calcium and phosphorus was that 25-OHG3 and calcitriol was reduced by dun contamination and also supplementing vitamin D3 or 25-OHD3 in animal feed did not improve either bone mineral content or uh, growth performances. So they were still uh, smaller and eating less. And after that, we also saw in the second uh, animal phase with the uh, calcium levels, the varying calcium levels, that the 25 OHG3 was still decreased during the depletion phase. So with how you've shown that the dawn can affect calcium and phosphorus absorption, what's the mechanism behind exactly how that works? It's hard to say with animals because we cannot go that uh, specific. But one hypothesis that we had that I tested uh, during an internship in France is that uh, DUN may affect uh, the, the intestinal epithelial barrier, so it would disrupt it. That was observed on uh, pig intestinal cells we called IPEC1. And so maybe it's the same case uh, in the entire animal. So what would it do is that um, the calcium and phosphorus digestibility we saw was increased. So it probably is because uh, the permeability of the barrier would be uh, increased. So more minerals, but also more uh, toxins and more also um, bacterial um, pathogens could go through the intestinal barrier. So the last question I have for you is kind of relating this back to the production side, but how can we as producers mitigate the impact of mycotoxin on our pig's growth? You can prevent it mostly by checking your feed if there's not too much mycotoxin, specifically the done here. Um, I know some uh, milling uh, centers, they have a... Um, Rosa M reader, they call, so they can evaluate uh, the level of mycotoxin. So that could help to know if it's too high. And so, well, in Canada, it's 5 ppm, the tolerable limit. It's not an obligation, but it's a recommendation um, in grains like just in corn, 5 ppm. And the finished product has to maximally, sorry, um, 1 ppm. So, yeah, you can check the concentrations on your uh, feed. And also in the storage is the big problem of humid humidity. So you have to have good conditions for storage to not develop uh, mycotoxins because to, uh, they like humidity to grow. And if there is mycotoxins, 
higher than one ppm. I would say more to 2.5 ppm where you can really see the effects on pigs. Um, the simplest way would be to dilute the feed with uncontaminated feed or less contaminated feed. You could also give it to animals that are less sensitive to uh, done. Um, either like polygastrics, they do not have the same effects uh, like pig, or you could give them to uh, older animals like uh, finishing pigs instead of nursery piglets because nursery piglets are more sensitive than uh, the older animals. Also, what you can do what we try to do in my project is uh, to uh, enhance the immune system with vitamins, but it could be other supplementations. And I know also um, about detoxifiers of mycotoxins that you could add to your feed. Um, I know there's a biotransformation products that you can use or uh, absorbent uh, binders that can be used too. Well, I believe that's all the time we have. So thank you, Beatrice, for coming on the show and sharing all your research with us. Thank you. And I'd like to thank my uh, director, of course, Marie-Pierre Letourneau-Mongny and Frédéric Gay for this re research. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week.